Heavenly Father, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to open up your word, to preach your word, to teach your word. Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray that you have free reign in my heart, my mind, my lips, my tongue. Uh, Father, I pray that the Spirit have free reign of each and every person here, their heart. I pray that you would speak to them. Though this uh, may sound like a salvation message, Father, it's truthful for each and every one of us whether we're saved or lost today. And I pray if there is one here that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, Father, you would speak to them in a mighty way. I pray that they're not almost persuaded, but fully persuaded. Lord, we do love you and we thank you, and I just pray that your guidance be uh, upon each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. Being fully persuaded is the title of this message. Fully persuaded. Almost only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades, right? Is that what we've always been told? Horseshoes and hand grenades. We have so many people in the world today that have almost were Christian if it wasn't for what? Other Christians. Sad, isn't it? Should break our hearts to know that. But... It does not matter when they fall short of, again, King Agrippa here was given the message. We're about to review this whole thing. Was given the opportunity, just as you are, just as people around the world are, but yet almost doesn't count. This story tells of a man who does just that, almost to the brink of the greatest decision he'll ever make. Isn't that right, Sister Susan? Sister Susan said that she had a flyer today about some kind of voting thing, and it's the most important decision she'll ever make for her entire life. I want to tell you something, my friend. The most important decision you'll ever make for your entire life and eternity is trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. So, I pray if you, are been, if you have been fully persuaded today, you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior. I pray that you're like Paul here, bold about your faith. You're encouraged by the stand he took. And this is not just something, I know many Christians, we, we read past this and we're like, amen. But it's something that speaks to you and encourages you to tell somebody else today. So the introduction, verses 1 and 2, on chapter 26, everybody still with 26? I'm sorry, I tried to get a bottle of water up here, but I just have a cup, so I may have to reach down every once in a while. I may put it up on this chair, because Lord knows I'm not a sitter. So, I have to feel awkward reaching down there every time. So, verses 1 and 2, it says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth his hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because... I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. So, when you give a preacher an opportunity to tell about Jesus, you better hold on, all right? (laughs) Not only did he give Paul the opportunity to speak of Jesus, he had an entire crowd to talk to. Let's look at... uh, Acts chapter 25, some of you may not even have to turn your page, 25 verses 22 and 23, says this. It says, Then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear uh, the man myself. Tomorrow uh, said he that thou hear him. And on the morrow when Agrippa was come and Bernice with great pomp and was entered into the place of hearing which the chief captains and princes principal men of the city, at Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. Not only did he have Agrippa and Festus, which were the highest ranking members in the Roman, uh, uh, in in Rome at that time, or Rome in in that area, but also he had all these principals and governors. It's like not only would we have the, the, I guess, governor or the county commissioners, but he had everybody there to tell about The saving grace of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you something. You may never stand before the president and be able to share Jesus Christ. 
You may never be able to stand before um, politicians up in Washington and be able to proclaim the words of Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you something. Right here in this mission field is just as important. And if you have an audience of 10, or if you have an audience of 10,000, it is important to let them know who Jesus is. It is important for them to know, or it is important for them to be given the opportunity to not almost be a Christian, but to be fully persuaded to be a Christian. Verse number 3, he says, especially because I know that thou art an expert in all custom and questions are among, among the Jews, whereof I beseech thee to hear me patiently. See, Paul was especially, especially excited about giving his testimony before King Agrippa because he was well learned in Jewish religion. What does that mean? Most people in America today have some kind of knowledge of who Jesus is. Maybe even went to church as a young kid, right? Maybe, maybe uh, they had grandparents who taught them Jesus Christ. But they don't know the gospel. They don't know the principles of what it means to be saved. I, I don't know, I don't care how many times I witness how amazed I am about how many people think because they were baptized as a kid, they're on their way to heaven. How many people have told me because their parents brought them to church and they've done a church thing when they were a kid that they're still saved? I want to tell you something, my friend. If you don't know Jesus Christ through the Word, you don't know Jesus Christ at all. And if you're depending on something you did, I couldn't say 25 years ago, something that you did, yes, let me say this, something you did 25 years ago, something you did yesterday, something you did however long ago it was, then you is the problem. I know I'm going to heaven because in 1991, Jesus saved my soul. I didn't do anything. Daniel could not do anything to save himself. It's everything that Jesus has done. So, let's look at this religious man, Paul. Verses 4 and 5. It says, my manner of life, my manner of life, uh, my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all and known all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most strict, straightest sects of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. What is Paul saying? He's saying he is a he could be the most proudful religious man he was the most proudful religious man and i think that's probably where we're at today why are more and more people rejecting jesus christ is because we have more and more proudful religious people we're, we're religious i get offended when somebody calls me religious i'm not religious i have a relationship with an almighty god i have a relationship with my god all right? True religion is to minister to the orphan and widows, James tells us. That's true religion. So, pride, pride here in Paul, if anybody could be proud about anything, it could have been Paul, right? Philippians 3, verses 4 and 6 say this, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh Thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh. I more circumcised on the eighth day the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, an Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteous, which is the law, blameless. What does he say? He goes, I was blameless. Matter of fact, I was so zealous of the Jewish religion, I was killing anybody that was trying to take it. I was so, so religious, and I was making sure that only the Jewish faith was going to stand. And not this old Jesus of Nazareth was going to come around and destroy everything that God has built. Whew. He was a religious. Not only was he religious, he was zealous about it. You know what Muslims have that we don't? 
zeal. They're, ze they're zealous about their faith. We're kind of half-hearted. Kind of, eh, go to church, maybe I won't. Read my Bible, maybe I won't. Pray, maybe I won't. I don't know. Whatever. Just take it one day at a time. They are zealous. Maybe zealous about the wrong thing, but they are zealous. But, as we are about to see, he realized, even in himself, it was just a show. I'm going to continue in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 8. Just reading a lot. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read it. Uh, but, what things were gained to me, those things I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I am suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I might win Christ. He said, all those things, it didn't matter how perfect I was. They're nothing compared to the knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ. I want to tell you right now, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't have the knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ, you don't really know anything. You can have everything that this world can possess. You can, not, you can have knowledge about everything and anything under the sun. But without Jesus Christ, what does Solomon say? It's vanity. It's all vanity. It's, it's, gar it, it's, it's worthless. It's pointless. We see he's a religious man. But then we see a promise of God. Promise of God. Verse number 6. Uh, 6 eight through 8. And now I stand and am judged of the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. He said, look, this was already promised to us. The Jews are trying to persecute me just as I persecuted the Christians, but this was already promised to us. Verse number 7. Unto which promise our 12 tribes instantly serving God, day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be a uh, tough thing that thou, th thing incredible with you, thought a tough, thought a thing incredible with you, that God should raise the dead. I, raise the dead. Let me stop right there. <clears throat> Lord, please help me with my mind. <clears throat> I think the pastor's rubbing off on me a little bit today. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, and, and for those of you who don't know, please pray for our pastor. He is sick. Obviously, he would have brought a better message, but you got me today. So all of this time, the Jews have been told of the Messiah being preached about. This was the hope of the world. And now Paul was being accused of this thing. He's saying, hey, G G being Jesus, God himself raised from the dead. You know what they were looking for? Jesus' second coming. They didn't understand Jesus' first coming and Jesus' second coming, which we know today here in the New Testament age. They were looking for Jesus' second coming. Are you looking forward to Jesus' second coming? I hope so. But you know he's coming with a rod of iron this time, right? You know he's not coming as a humble servant. Now in the Old Testament, all they could see is Rod of iron, humble servant. They saw all these things. They didn't know he was coming twice. I want to tell you right now, I'm glad he came twice. You know why? Because I wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here. If Jesus would only came one time, he would have saved the world from all their sins 2,000 years ago, and none of us would have existed. But I'm glad he saw through, the, through time that each and every one of us would accept him without seeing, right? What, does he tell, what did he tell Thomas? Blessed are those who believe without seeing. We're blessed more than Thomas. It's just, I don't know, that's just a good thought. Anyways, <clears throat> the persecution for God. So, you see, we saw the promise for God, and then we're going to see the persecution for God. When we think we're doing God a favor, what happens? Kind of get ourselves out of control, don't we? Get ourselves out of control. Verse number 9 tells us this. It says, For I verily thought 
with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. You see, Paul's first mistake was he thought with himself. That's our first mistake in sin. We think within ourselves. Uh, I'll give you a few scriptures real quick. Proverbs 16.2 says, all, all the ways of man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. John 16.2 says, They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think he doeth God service. You know, this is talking about uh, last days. And when they kill you, they'll think they're doing God service. Ugh. How many people have actually seen this in our recent day and age? Seen it on TV? Think they're doing God a service, yet killing innocent people. Verses 10 and 12, 10 through 12 rather, says, Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut in prison, having received authority from the chief priest when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to be blasphemed, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even into the strange cities. Whereupon I went unto Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest. See, Paul was relentless against the work of Christ. Some, some would have to say, well, I've done too many bad things for God to forgive me. Or if I ever went to a church building, it would burn down. You need to tell them, God saved a murderer of many Christians, but became one of the greatest evangelists, preachers, and teachers of all time. Were they a Paul? I don't know of anybody that's a Paul. Paul was zealous about the work of God. He was murdering Christians by the droves. If he wasn't having them murdered, he was having them imprisoned. And yet, how many of y'all have imprisoned and murdered Christians. No. But God still saved Paul. Amen. That's why when we look out in these streets. When we go into our neighborhoods. And we see oh somebody out here that we don't want to associate with. God can save them. God can save them. God can save the next person. And the next person. I don't know about you. I thank God. He's still in the saving business. Amen? I, still th I thank God that He still saves souls. I thank God that He saved my soul, but it doesn't matter what they have done, God can forgive them. And God can bring forgiveness. I think that's a sober reminder for me. Because what's the hardest thing about forgiveness? Forgiving yourself, isn't it? Forgiving yourself. Like, oh, so-and-so forgave you for whatever, and then you, you, the devil continues to remind you, God has already forgotten all about it, but the devil continues to remind you that you are nothing, and you can't forgive yourself. I want to tell you something. God has forgiven you, and God is above all. So let it go. So, next, he saved from sin. I don't know about you, but I'm glad I was saved from my sin. If you're not saved from sin today, you're missing out on the greatest feeling of all time. The greatest feeling of all time. Let me see if I can get through this. Hold on, let me get another sip of water here. All right, let me uh, see if I can get through this. 13 through 18 says, And at midday, O king, I saw in the way of the light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? That always cracks me up. You hear a voice from heaven and you fall to ground and you say, Who art thou, Lord? You already know it's the Lord speaking to you. <laughs> who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. 
but rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have, I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both, to, both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles of whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from the darkness to light and from the powers of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanct are sancti eh, excuse me sacrificed sanctified thank you sanctified by faith in faith that is in me oh my goodness <laughs> All right, I can do this. <laughs> One thing I always want to point out is when people reject the message we carry, they don't reject us. They reject Jesus. Remember that. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. That always reminds me of a missionary story of when the guy went to the mission field and he was killed and his blood ran rivers, and all of a sudden the next missionaries came in. They thought they were going to be killed. They said, well, it is our tradition if the blood, if your blood runs through these rivers, then we'll have to listen to those people. So they listened to the people, listened to the next missionaries, and the whole village was saved. Came to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Folks, we may be martyrs for Christ. I don't know. I don't know what the future holds. The way, the crazy as this world is becoming, who knows? How many of y'all really thought that any of this in 2020 would ever happen? I mean, I could ask you January and told you where you would be today, and y'all be like, no way. You're dumb, Brother Daniel. And here we are. But I want to tell you, life happens like that. You know, some of us may be an inconvenience this entire year, but some have experienced true loss. True loss. Um, uh, I don't know if many of y'all know, but Brother Randy, or Brother Brenniger, I can't even say his first name now. Rusty, thank you. Brother Rusty Brenniger uh, went on to be with the Lord. I want to tell you something. Most of us could go on and go on about how this year has been bad for us. But Jesus isn't done with us yet. We need to be reminded of that. Life can change quickly, but Jesus ain't done with us yet. And we may be martyrs, but there may be somebody after us that comes up. And because, of our martyr, because we've been martyred for the cause of Christ, may be able to witness to an entire village and win them to Jesus Christ. What, I, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say stay faithful even in these crazy times. Stay faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. If anything else, I don't know what better time to be faithful to Jesus. Amen? <laughs> so, verse 18 paints a perfect picture of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read it again. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the powers of Satan unto God that they, may be, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and the inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. In me, he says. How is sanctification? It is in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. <clears throat> Am I running out of time? Is that clock right? Oh my goodness, I still got another hour. Praise the Lord. <laughs> no, I got a couple more points and then we'll be done. I know this is a long message and y'all are thinking, man, he is going on forever. But uh, I, I, I don't know if y'all have ever had to study for a message. Sister uh, Angie, right? You do pastor's messages. Jessica does mine, all right? <laughs> so anyways, uh, you start studying and you start digging and you start look and you just there's just so much good stuff you just don't want to let it go. 
So y'all bear with me. I know you're tired. You're ready to eat and everything. You're ready to go home. But I'm almost done. All right? Obedient to God. So when we see the message of God, are we going to be obedient to God? Verse number 19 through 23. Verse number 19 says this. It says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. He was not disobedient to the he heavenly vision. Paul was obedient to God, such as should we. Verse number 20. But showed first unto them of Damascus and of Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and, to, and, and then to the Gentiles that they, should, that they should repent unto God and do works meet for repentance. Let me stop right there. Because of his obedience to Christ, he made new friends, but also he made new enemies. Verse number 21. For this cause the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill, to kill me. When you start preaching Jesus, you may lose some old friends, you may gain new ones, but I'll tell you right now, you're going to gain a lot of enemies too. They sought about to kill him, verse number 22. Having therefore obedient, uh, obtained help from God, I continued unto this day, witnessing both small and great, saying none other thing than those things which are which the prophets and Moses did say should come. Excuse me, verse 23. That Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show the light unto the people and to the Gentiles. I thank God the gospel is for all. It's for everyone. And he started where? Where he was in Damascus. Wherever you get saved, I want to tell you right now, that's where you start preaching Jesus. And then you go back to your hometown. He went from Jer Jerusalem to Judea, and then he went to the uttermost parts of the city. It's perfect. That's what we're supposed to do. Spreading the gospel. Spreading the gospel. So, then we see the rebuttal. Verse 24. He says, and this is the sad part, And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. First, Festus speaks against Paul and thinks he's gone crazy because of all of his knowledge. I want to tell you right now, some people do go crazy over too much knowledge. No amen on that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I'll keep my college and career comments to myself. Uh, anyways, verse number 25. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but I speak forth the words of truth so, and soberness. Paul affirms that he is in his right mind and speaks truth. Now, he turns to King Agrippa and tells him that he knows that he knows that he knows that he knows he is going on. He knows what's going on and what has happened to Jesus of Nazareth. Let's look at that exchange. Verse number 26. For the king knoweth these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. Remember at the beginning of the chapter? He says, hey, I am excited, King Agrippa, that you are here. You know why? Because I know you know who Jesus is. And I know you studied and you, you, know, uh, you know the Word of God. You studied the Word of God. And I'm about to show you some things. I want to tell you something. Just because somebody knows the Word of God, they've studied the Word of God, doesn't mean they have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and are saved. Sobering thought, isn't it? Bible quiz. Oh, I got the first answer. Oh, I got the first answer. I know all the Bible questions. I had somebody told me who's living out in the world and living in sin right now. My daddy was a preacher and there isn't nothing anybody can preach on that I don't already know. But they're probably lost and on their way to a devil's hell. I want to tell you something. I hope they're saved. I don't know their heart. But Jesus said by their fruits you shall know them. Sobering. We may know all the things there is to know about Jesus, but do we know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior? 
Paul now gives the invitation to King Agrippa to believe in Christ. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. I know that you believe. But he refuses. Then King Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. If you're here today, I don't want you to be almost persuaded to be a Christian. The title of the message is being fully persuaded. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you, hell is knocking at your door. Sobering, but it's reality. How many have followed King Agrippa's tragic example? Last, last point, and then we can all go eat. And I'll be done in five minutes. Look at that, right on time. The plea. Verse 29. This is Paul pleading. And if you're here and lost and don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this is my plea to you. Verse 29. And Paul said, I would to God, I would to God, that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether as I am, except in these bonds. Now, he was bound before King Agrippa and Festus, but he was still a free man. He was free in Jesus. I don't know what your issue is here today. The Lord knows we all got them. <laughs> we have more problems than we could probably shake a stick at. And I don't know about your salvation. Like I said, the gentleman that I talked to that said, they know everything about the Bible, but they don't live nothing near it. I hope they're saved. But I'll tell you this much right now. If there's any time to be living for Jesus, now's the time. If you're not ready to meet Jesus, I'd be terrified if I was you. We all talked... I, I almost, I was leaning towards the message, the king is coming. Whew. The king is coming. But I don't think most of us are prepared for the king is coming. I think we'd be terrified if the rapture was to happen in this building and half of us or maybe more, I pray all of us be gone. But maybe you would be sitting there lonely. You knew all the scriptures. You knew all the Bible verses. You knew everything to say. But you never had the heart conversion. Your soul changed. The twice born. You were never born again. If you're here today and you don't know what that means and you don't know what I'm talking about, I encourage you, come speak to me. I'd love to show you what God says about being saved. This is the most important decision you will ever make. If you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior here today, and you're ready for the rapture, I encourage you to be as Paul. Stretch forth out your hand and preach the gospel. This world needs it. We we're talking about in Sunday school this morning. Where did we go wrong? Marriages are crumbling. Our children are rebelling. Our people are burning institutions down, memorials. Where did we go wrong? I preached in Comanche last week. You want to tell you where we went wrong? Or we took Bible and prayer out of schools. That's where we went wrong. I'm almost 40 years old. And guess what? You've raised a generation that knows not God. The only God I know was from my mother. She drugged me. 
She drugged me to this service and drugged me to that service and drugged me to this service. But if it wasn't for her and godly people praying for me, Lord knows where I'd be today. It definitely wasn't the world system. And I want to tell you right now, you see these kids right here? How often do you guys get to come to church? Sundays, Wednesdays. How often do y'all get to go to school? Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays. How often do they get peers to tell them what's acceptable and what's not acceptable? What about those kids that aren't in church that are out there that still need to hear Jesus Christ and their parents could care less? At least we got good parents saying, hey, yes, my kids love for them to be in church. Folks, we're reaping what we have sown for years and years and years. We better be prepared because Jesus is coming. I don't know about you, but I see things happening in the Middle East and it excites me. Because I know the King is coming. The King is coming. I'm not a good singer. I'll let Brother Dennis finish with that song. <laughs> let us uh, bow our heads and close in a, Lord, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your blessings. Father, I pray we be as bold as Paul. Lord, this man was persecuted, he was beaten, he was shipwrecked. Father, for his faith, for just proclaiming the name of Jesus. Father, we don't face half the persecution that this man has faced. We don't face a tenth of the persecution that this man has faced. And yet we are still cowards to not share our faith. Father, I pray we be more bold. To tell others Jesus still saves and Jesus loves them. And not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray that we start acting like children of God. I pray that we not turn off more and more people. Father, forgive me from where I failed you. And maybe have lost some people that I should have been a better witness to. Father, help me to be as bold as Paul and proclaim your faith, the faith of the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ to all nations. Use me, Lord, wherever you want me. I thank you again for this opportunity. I pray that you'd be with our pastor. Give him a speedy recovery. Most importantly, Father, I do pray if there's someone here that does not know Jesus Christ as Savior, They'd make that decision before it's everlasting too late. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen.